Among the recommendations, tightening restrictions on automatic and semi-automatic weapons, limits on stockpiling ammunition, a national hub for mass casualty responses, amendments to the RCMP Act, and a gender-based violence commissioner. The report details a list of failures by the Nova Scotia RCMP, the National Police Force, at the center of calls for reform today. Mike, Michael Duhem is the force's interim commissioner. Hi, Commissioner. Good to meet you and good to have you on our program this evening. Uh, good evening, Vashti. Glad, I'm happy to be here. Uh, Commissioner, I, I listened to the questions you received from reporters today at your press conference, and uh, I, I wanted to, to ask you once again, if you did receive this report um, in its entirety yesterday morning at 9, and I acknowledge it's very long, 3,000 pages, there's many recommendations, but, but why had you not taken even a single look inside it? So, so the full report came in at 11.30 yesterday, and Vasi, I, I, I was not involved in the managing of the incident when it happened. I, was, I had another portfolio, and I thought it was important to come here yesterday afternoon to go to the site to have a better understanding of what the victims went through, the various crime scenes, and what actually our members went through. So just to give me a better understanding of what actually took place on this horrific incident that's never been seen in Canadian history. I spent some time in the afternoon meeting with members, members who were the frontline members who attended on that specific day, and also spent some time with the province, the, uh, the deputy minister at the provincial level, and also in the evening I met with a family member. Should anyone take, and I, and I understand that, and, and again I acknowledge that the report is very long and that there are many recommendations. But I think that the reason that you got so many questions about it is because uh, there is a concern among some Nova Scotians perhaps and some other Canadians that this isn't going to be taken as seriously as they would like it to be taken. Should anyone draw from the fact that you have not looked at it yet that that is the case? I, I, don't think, uh, I, I don't think anybody should draw a conclusion on that. Even if I would have gone through the 3,000-page report or the executive summary, it would, I, would have just, I would have just known the surface, the recommendations, not really dig deep as to a better understanding of what the recommendations are for. I met with family members yesterday. I met with family members today, and I committed to them. And today, during my press conference, I did commit to people that we will be following up on it. The RCMP has put a team together to go through all the recommendations that came out from the commission. We will put a tracking mechanism in place, put it on the info web so that people can see the program progress and my my responsibility ensuring that's done with my senior executive team as well as every member uh, has a role to play because it's very important for us to uh, there's a question of trust with the public uh, we want to rebuild that trust and the accountability and what we have put in place we're, we'll be heading towards that direction and I appreciate Commissioner that you'll be making the progress public but can I ask you very specifically how much time you expect the force to take to respond to the recommendations fully so, so to tell the public for example we're going to adopt one and three and four but not this one or this one can, can you give us a timeline for when the public will know which of these recommendations you will heed? Well, Vasi, again, I, I'm committed to go through all the recommendations. And of the 130 recommendations, there's 75 that are directed at the RCMP. So I, I can't speak for the other ones, but what I can assure everyone, Canadians, Nova Scotians, Canadians, is the fact that we will be going through every single recommendation and make sure that we report on it and work with other stakeholders uh, who are part of those recommendations. Respectfully, Commissioner, the reason I'm asking about time is because a lot of time has passed, right, since, since what happened. There is a high level of public awareness around uh, the shortcomings, as the commissioners called them, of the RCMP during this. And so I, I take your point that you're going to look through them all, and, and I'm sure Canadians appreciate that commitment, but that isn't the same as saying we'll tell you if we're going to follow through on these. And, and I ask again because there's been a lot of other reports produced that talk about recommendations for the RCMP that, that have never been followed. So is, is there a way you can tell Canadians tonight, look, in six months you'll know which of these we end up following in a year, in a year and a half, anything like that you can tell them? So, so Vasi, I'm committed to, once we go through the recommendations, to set a timeline as to what, uh, what needs to be done. But I think it's important to highlight to Nova Scotians and Canadians is that we didn't wait for the MCC report to come out to actually take action. As the MCC inquiry was going ahead, we were analyzing some of the discussions, some of the, the trends that we were seeing, and we have brought changes in the way we operate. For instance, the public alert system 
in Nova Scotia was never meant to be used for a public safety event. And that's changed since the horrific events from April 2020, and it has had a ripple effect throughout the country. So that is one huge change of getting the message out early so that the community and the people know uh, that there is a danger. And, and certainly I think communication is something that was flagged as a shortcoming of the RCMP, but it's not the only thing, right? And, and, and I'm sure Canadians will appreciate that you've made some movement, but there's a whole lot of other things that this report flags as well, such as the RCMP's inability to take, uh, you know, what neighbours were saying or what the first victim of the perpetrator was saying about what he was wearing seriously or about the car that he was in seriously. H have you moved on that front already? And, and if not, why not? So, so, so we have follow-up. When we look at the disposals of police vehicles, disposals of uniform, the province of Nova Scotia brought in a provincial legislation. But, but again, Vasi, I think it's important to highlight here the, the, uh, the incident, the, the situation, the incident that took place on April 2020 uh, was never seen in Canadian history. Uh, it was complex. Uh, it was, uh, you, you're looking after someone who actually has a car in uniform like that in a, in, in a rural setting. Very complex, and that's why I felt it was important for me to go to the scenes and have an appreciation of what took place uh, on, those, uh, on April 18th and 19th. Respectfully, it was complex, but I'm not talking about the complexity of it. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that it's very clearly stated throughout much of the testimony as well as in the report itself that uh, RCMP officers, 911 dispatchers, were, were inclusively, were not taking information that they were getting about this perpetrator seriously. And they were not, in turn, communicating it to each other or developing a plan to deal with it or communi communicating it to the public at large. Do you agree that those are shortcomings? Well, I look forward to, to, to really looking at the recommendations that are specific to what you just, uh, what you just uh, uh, mentioned. And, and again, uh, what we want to do is obviously we want to learn from our shortcomings and make sure that we be better and make sure that what we learn is also shared with law enforcement, law enforcement agencies throughout the country and as well internationally. You said today when you were asked a number of questions about this kind of stuff that, um, and you, you, know, you, you, you did certainly express your condolences to the family and the families of the victims and, and talk about the victims, but, but you also said that, that the officers involved did the best they could. And I think I understand your inclination to do that because they were, as you said, faced with a really complex situation. But based on what this commission uncovered, uh, do you think it is fair to say that they did the best they could? Or do you understand how Canadians listening would take that as a bit of defensiveness and inappropriately so? So the last thing I want is for Canadians to think that this is defensiveness. And that's the purpose why I went to the scene and I spoke to the first responders. When you're getting at the scene, there's multiple fires, multiple explosions, gunfires. There's decisions to be made based on the environment and the information that you have. And from how I was brief of the incident, I am fully comfortable that the members who were there and the employees who were part of that operation did whatever they could to make sure that they'd stop the situation as fast as they could. Do you really think that, though? If, if, for example, they had information that he was in an RCMP vehicle and they didn't convey it, uh, if they listened to Lisa Banfield, the spouse of the perpetrator, and you know, re-victimized her, for example, and didn't take the information she presented a a as serious, and, and I'm not trying to malign all of them. I know they're protecting our Canadians, and they're doing the, you know, in many cases, they're doing the best they can. But I think what this report shows is that they didn't, in fact. So, so again, Vasi, we will be going through the recommendations and do everything we can to improve the current state of, of the RCMP when responding to these types of events and learn from what happened. Okay, Commissioner, I'm out of time. I do appreciate your time. Thank you very much.